All right. C W A. Three simple letters. But what stands behind them is not simple at all. For various reasons, the Corona One app has been one of the most talked about digital projects of the year. Behind its rather simplistic facade, there are many considerations that went into the app's design to protect its users and their data. While they might not be visible for most users, these goals had a direct influence on the software architecture. For instance, the risk calculation. Here today to talk about some of these backend elements is one of the solution architects of the Corona One app, Thomas Klingbeil. And I'm probably not the only one here at IC3, uh, RC3 who's an active user. Now, I'm pretty curious to hear more about what's going on behind the scenes of the app. So without further ado, let's give a warm virtual welcome to Thomas Klingbeil. Thomas, the stream is yours. Hello, everybody. I'm Thomas Klingbeil, and today in the session, I would like to talk about the German Corona One app and give you a little tour behind the scenes of the app development the underlying technologies and which things are invisible to the end user but still very important for the app itself. First, I would like to give you a short introduction to the app, the underlying architecture and the used technologies, for example, the exposure notification framework. Then I would like to have a look on the communication between the app and the back end and looking at which possible privacy threats could be found there and how we mitigated them, of course, And then I would like to dive a little bit into the risk calculation of the app to show you what it actually means if there's a red or a green screen visible to the end user. First of all, we can ask ourselves the question, what is the Corona One app actually? So here it is. This is the German Corona One app. You can download it from the app stores. And once you have onboarded onto the app, you will see the following. Up here, it shows you that the exposure logging is active, which means this is the currently active app. Then you have this green card. Green means it's low risk because there have been no exposures so far. The logging has been permanently active and it has just updated this afternoon. So everything is all right. Let's say you've just been tested at a doctor's. Then you could click this button here and you get to this screen where you're able to retrieve your test result digitally. To do this, you can scan a QR code, which is on the form you receive from your doctor, and then you will get an update as soon as the test result is available. Of course, you can also get more information about the active exposure logging. When you click the button up here, then you get to this screen, and there you can learn more about the transnational exposure logging because the German Corona One app is not alone. It is connected to other Corona apps of other countries within Europe, so users from other countries can meet and they will be informed mutually about possible encounters. So, just to be sure, I would like to quickly dive into the terminology of the exposure notification framework so you know what I'm talking about during this session. It all starts with a temporary exposure key, which is generated on the phone and which is valid for 24 hours. From this temporary exposure key, several things are derived. First, for example, there's the rolling proximity identifier key and the associated encrypted metadata key. This part down here we can skip for the moment being and look at the generation of the rolling proximity identifiers. Those rolling proximity identifiers are only valid for 10 minutes each because they're, when they're regularly exchanged once the Bluetooth MAC address change takes place. So the rolling proximity identifier is basically the Bluetooth payload your phone uses when the exposure notification framework is active and broadcasting. When I say broadcasting, I mean every 250 milliseconds, your phone sends out its own rolling proximity identifiers so other phones around Uh, which are scanning for signal in the air, basically, can catch them and store them locally. So look, let's look at the receiving side. This is what we see down here. 
And now, as I already mentioned, we've got those Bluetooth low energy beacon mechanics sending out those rolling proximity identifiers and they are received down here. This is all a very uh, simplified schematic just to give you an impression of what's going on there. So now we've got those rolling proximity identifiers stored on the receiving phone and now somehow this other phone needs to find out that there has been a match. This happens by transforming those temporary exposure keys into diagnosis keys, which is just a renaming, but as soon as someone has tested positive and a temporary exposure key is linked to a positive diagnosis, it is called diagnosis key. And they are uploaded to a server, and I'm drastically simplifying here. So they receive the other phone. Here they are downloaded. All those diagnosis keys are extracted again. And as you can see, the same functions are applied. Again, HKDF, then AES, and we get a lot of rolling proximity identifiers for matching here, down here, and there, those are the ones we have stored. And now we can match them and find out which of those rolling proximity identifiers we have seen so far. And of course, the receiving phone can also make sure that the rolling proximity identifiers belonging to a single diagnosis key, which means they belong to one single other phone, are connected to each other. So we can also track exposures which have lasted longer than 10 minutes. So for example, if you're having a meeting of 90 minutes, this would allow the exposure notification framework to get together those up to nine rolling proximity identifiers and transform them into a single encounter, which you then get enriched with those associated encrypted metadata, which is basically just the transmit power um, as a summary down here. So now that we know which data are being transferred from phone to phone, we can have a look at the actual architecture of the app itself. This gray box here is the mobile phone and down here is the German Corona One app. It's a dashed line, uh, which means there's more documentation available online. So I can only invite you to go to the uh, GitHub repository, have a look at our code and of course our documentation. So there are more diagrams available. And as you can see, the app itself does not store a lot of data. So those boxes here are storages. So it only stores something called a registration token and the contact journal entries for our most recent version, which means that's all the app stores itself. What you can see here is that it's connected to the operating system API SDK for the exposure notifications. So that's the exposure notification framework to which we interface, which takes care of all the key collecting, broadcasting and key matching as well. Then there's a protocol buffer library, which we need for the data transfer. And we use the operating system cryptography libraries, or basically the SDK. So we don't need to include external libraries for that. What you can see here is the OS API SDK for push messages, but this is not remote push messaging, but only locally. So the app triggers local notifications and to the user it appears as if the notifications, the push message came in remotely, but actually it only uses remote uh, local messages. But what would the app be without the actual backend infrastructure? So you can see here, that's the Corona One app server. That's the actual backend for managing all the keys. And you see the upload path here. It's aggregated there, then provided through the content delivery network and downloaded by the app here. But we've got more, we've got the verification server, which has the job of verifying a positive test result. And how does it do that? There's basically two ways. Um, it can either get the information that a positive test is true through a so-called teleton, which is the most basic way, because people call up the hotline, get one of those teleton, enter it into the app, and then they are able to upload the diagnosis keys. Or if people use the fully digital way, they get their test result through the app, and that's why we have the test result server up here, which can be queried by the verification server. So users can get their test result through the infrastructure. 
but that's not all, because as I've promised earlier, we've also got the connection to other European countries. So down here is the European Federation Gateway Service, which gives us the possibility to A, upload our own national keys to this European Federation Gateway Service, so other countries can download them and distribute them to their users. But we can also request foreign keys and, gets even better, we can be informed if new foreign keys are available for download through a callback mechanism, which is just here on the right side. So once the app is communicating with the backend, what would actually happen if someone is listening? So we've got our data flow here and let's have a look at it. So in step one, we are actually scanning the QR code with a camera of the phone and extracted from the QR code will be a GUID, which is then fed into the Corona One app. You can see here, it is never stored within the app. That's very important because we wanted to make sure that as few information as possible needs to be stored within the app and also that it's not possible to connect information from different sources, for example, to trace back diagnosis key to a GUID uh, to allow uh, personification. It was very important that this step is not possible, so um, we had to take care that no data is stored together and data cannot be connected again. So in step one, we get this GUID, and this is then hashed on the phone, being sent to the verification server, which in step three generates a so-called registration token and stores it together so it stores the hash GUID and the hash registration token, making sure that a GUID can only be used once, and returns the unhashed registration token to the app here. Now the app uh, can store the registration token and use it in step five for polling for test results, but the test results are not available directly on the verification server because we do not store it here but the verification server connects to the test result server by using the hash GUID, which it can get from the hashed registration token here. And then it can ask the test result server and the test result server might have a data set connecting the hash GUID to a test result. And this check needs to be done because the test result server might also have no information for this hash GUID and this only means that no test result has been received yet. This is what happens here in step A. The lab information system, the LIS, can supply the test result server with a package of hash GUID and the test result, so it's stored there. And if it's available already in a test result server, it is returned to the verification server here in step seven and accordingly in step eight to the app. You might have noted the test result is also neither cached nor stored here on the verification server, which means if the user then decides to upload the keys, a ton is required uh, to pass on to the backend for verification of the positive test. An equal flow needs to be followed. So in step nine, again, the um, registration token is passed to the ton endpoint. The verification server once more needs to check with the test result server that it's actually a positive test result, gets back here in step 11. A ton is generated in step 12. You can see the ton is not stored in plain text, but it's stored as a hash. But the plain text is, re is returned to the app, which can then bundle it with the diagnosis keys extracted from the exposure notification framework and upload it to the Corona One app server, or more specifically, the submission service but this also needs to verify that it's authentic. So it takes it in step 15 to the verification server on the verify endpoint where the ton is validated and validation means it is marked as used already. So the same ton cannot be used twice. And then the response is given to the backend here, which can then, if it's positive, so uh, which means if it's an authentic ton, can store the diagnosis keys in its own storage. And as you can see, only the diagnosis keys are stored here, nothing else. So there's no correlation possible between diagnosis keys, 
registration token or even GUID because it's completely separate. But still, what could be found out about users if someone were to observe the network traffic going on there? An important assumption in the beginning, the content of all the messages is secure because only secure connections are being used and only the size of the transfer is observable. So we can, from a network sniffing perspective, observe that a connection is created. We can observe how many bytes are being transferred back and forth, but we cannot learn about the content of the message. So here we are. We've got the first communication between app and server in step two, because we can see, okay, if someone is requesting something from the registration token endpoint, this person has been tested maybe on that specific day. Then there's the next communication going on in step five, because this means that the person has been tested. I mean, we might know that from step two already, but this person has still not received a test result. So it might still be positive or negative. If we can observe that the request to the TAN endpoint takes place in step nine, then we know the person has been tested positive. So, okay, we're using HTTPS, so we cannot actually learn which endpoint is being queried, but there might be specific sizes to those individual requests, which might allow us to learn about the direction the request is going into. Just as a thought. Okay, and then, of course, we've got also the submission service in step 14, where users upload their diagnosis keys and their TAN. And this is really, really without any possibility for discussion, because if a app contacts the Corona One app server and builds up a connection there, this must mean that the user has been tested positive and is submitting diagnosis keys. Apart from that, once the user submits diagnosis keys and talks, the app talks to the Corona One app backend, it could also be possible to relate those keys to an origin IP address, for example. Or could there be a way around that? So what we need to do in this scenario and what we did is to establish plausible deniability, which basically means we generate so much noise with the connections we build up that it's not possible to identify individuals which actually use those connections to query their test results, to receive their test result uh, if it's positive, to retrieve a ton, or to upload their keys. So generating noise is the key. So what the app actually does is simulate the backend traffic by sending those fake or dummy requests according to a so-called playbook. So we've got a, we call it playbook, uh, from which the app takes which requests to do, how long to wait, how often to repeat those requests, and so on. And it's also interesting that those requests might either be triggered by a real event, or they might be triggered by just some random trigger. So uh, scanning a QR code or entering a teleton also triggers this flow a little bit different, but it still triggers it, because if you then get your registration token, retrieve your test results, and the retrieval of your test results stops at some point, this must mean, okay, there has been a test result, negative or positive. If it's then observable that you communicate to the submission service, this would mean that it has been positive. So what the app actually does is, even, even if it is negative, it continues sending out dummy requests to the verification server. And it might also, so that's all based on random decisions within the app, it might also then retrieve a fake TAM and it might do a fake upload of diagnosis keys. So in the end, you're not able to distinguish between an app actually uploading real data or an app just doing playbook stuff and uh, creating noise. So users really uploading their diagnosis keys cannot be picked out from all the noise. And to make sure that our backend is not just swamped with all those fake and dummy requests, 
there's a special header field which informs the backend to actually ignore those requests. But if you would just ignore them and not send a response, it could be implemented on the client, but then it would be observable again that it's just a fake request. So what we do is we let the backend skip all the interaction with the underlying database infrastructure, do not modify any data and so on, but there will be a delay in the response and the response will look exactly the same as if it was the response to a real request. Also on the data, both directions from the client to the server and from the server to the client uh, gets some padding. So it's always the same size, no matter what information is contained in this data packages. So observing the data packages, so their size does not help in finding out what's actually going on. Now you could say, okay, if there's so much additional traffic because there are fake requests being sent out and fake uploads being done and so on, this must cost a lot of data traffic to the users. And there's the good point. It is all zero rating, uh, zero rated with the German mobile operators, which means it's not charged to the end customers, but um, it's just being paid for. Now, there's still that thing with the extraction of information from the metadata while uploading the diagnosis keys. And this metadata might be the source IP address. It might be the user agent being used. So then you can distinguish Android from iOS. And possibly you could also find out about the OS version. And to prevent that, we have introduced an intermediary server, which removes the metadata from the requests and just forwards the plain content of the packages basically to the backend service. So the backend service, the submission service, is not able to tell from where this package came from. Now for the risk calculation, we can have a look at which information is available here. So we've got the information about encounters, which are calculated at the device receiving the rolling proximity identifiers, as mentioned earlier. And those information come into us in 30 minute exposure windows. So I mentioned earlier that all the rolling proximity identifiers belonging to a single diagnosis key, so a single day UTC basically that is, um, can be related to each other. But what the exposure notification framework then does is split up those encounters in 30 minute windows. So um, the first scan instance where a, another device has been identified starts the exposure window and then it's filled up until 30 minutes are full. And if there's more encounters with the same diagnosis key, basically a new window started and so on. A single exposure window only contains a single device. So it's a one to one mapping. And within that window, we can find the number of the scan instances. So scans take place every three to five minutes. And within those scan instances, there are also multiple scans and we get the minimum and the average attenuation per instance. And the attenuation is actually the reported transmit power of the device minus the signal strength when receiving the signal. So it basically tells us how much signal strength got lost on the way. If we talk about a low attenuation, this means the other device has been very close. If the attenuation is higher, it means the other device is farther away. And from the other way around, so through the diagnosis keys, which have been uploaded to a server, processed on the back end, provided on CDN and came to us through that way, we can also get information about the infectiousness of the user, which is encoded in something we call transmission risk level, um, which tells us how big the risk of infection from that person on that specific day has been. So the transmission risk level is based on the symptom status of a person. And the symptoms status means is the person symptomatic, asymptomatic, does the person want to tell about the symptoms or maybe do they not want to tell about the symptoms? And in addition to that, if there have been symptoms, 
It can also be clarified whether the symptom start was on a specific day, whether it has been a range of multiple days when the symptoms started, or people could also say, I'm not sure about when the symptoms started, but there have been symptoms, definitely. So this is the first case. People can specify when the symptoms started. And we can say that's the symptom start down here. And around that date of symptom begin of uh, the onset of symptoms, it's basically evenly spread the risk of infection. Um, red means a high risk, blue means a low risk. See, when you move around that symptom start day, also the infectiousness moves around. And um, there's basically a matrix from where this information is derived. Again, you can find that all in the code. And there's also the possibility to say, okay, the symptoms started somewhere within the last seven days. That's the case up here. See, it's spread a little bit differently. Users could also specify it started somewhere from one to two weeks ago. You can see that here in the second chart. And the third chart is the case for when the symptoms started more than two weeks ago. Now, here's the case that users specify that they just received the positive test results, so they're definitely corona positive, but they have never had symptoms, which might mean they are asymptomatic or presymptomatic. And again, you see around the submission, there is a increased risk, but all the time before here only has a low transmission risk level assigned. If users want to specify that they can't remember when the symptoms started, but they definitely had symptoms, then it's all spread a little bit differently. And equally, if users do not want to share the information whether they had symptoms at all. So now we've got this big risk calculation chart here, and I would like to walk you quickly through it. So on the left, we've got the configuration which is being fed into the exposure notification framework by Apple Google, because there's also some mappings which the framework needs from us. There is some internal configuration because we have decided to do a lot of the risk calculation within the app instead of doing it in the framework, mainly because we have decided we want a eight level transmission risk level instead of the um, only three levels, so low, standard and high which Apple and Google provide to us. For the sake of having those eight levels, we actually sacrifice the parameters of infectiousness, which is derived from the parameter days since onset of symptoms, and the report type, which is always confirmed test here in Europe. Um, so we got those three bits actually, which we can now use as the transmission risk level, which is encoded on the server in those two fields added to the keys on the uh, content delivery network, downloaded by the app, and then passed through the calculation here. So it comes in here. It is assembled from those two parameters, report type and infectiousness. And now it goes along. So first we need to look whether the sum of the durations at below 73 decibels, so that's our first threshold, has been less than 10 minutes. If it has been less than 10 minutes, we just drop the whole exposure window. If it has been more or equal 10 minutes, we might use it depending on whether the transmission risk level is larger or equal 3. And we use it. And now we actually calculate the relevant time. And times between 60, um, between 55 and 63 decibels are only counted half because that's a medium distance and times at below 55 decibels, that's up here, are counted full. Those are added up and then we've got the weight exposure time and now we've got this transmission risk level which leads us to a normalization factor basically and this is multiplied with the weight exposure time. What we get here is the normalized exposure time per exposure window. And those times for each window are added up for the whole day. And then there's the threshold of 15 minutes, which decides whether the day had a high risk of infection or a low risk. So now that you all know how to do the risk calculation, 
we can walk through it for three examples. So the first example is here. It's a transmission risk level of 7. You can see those all are pretty close, so our magic thresholds are here at 73. That's for whether it's counted or not. Then at 63, it's this line, and at 55. So we see, okay, there's been a lot of close contact going on and some medium range contact as well. So let's do the pre-filtering, even though we already see it. Has it been at least 10 minutes? below 73 decibels? Yes, definitely, because each of those dots represents three minutes. So uh, for this example calculation, I just assumed the scan windows are three minutes apart. Is it at least transmission risk level three? Yes, it's even seven. So now we do the calculation. It has been 18 minutes at a low attenuation, so at a close proximity, so that's 18 minutes and nine minutes, those are those three dots here, at a medium attenuation, so a little bit farther apart, they count as four and a half minutes. We've got a factor here, adding it up, it gets us to 25 minutes, multiplied by 1.4, giving us 31.5 minutes, which means a red status, already with a single window. Now, in this example, we can always see that pretty far away and there's been one close encounter here, uh, transmission risk level 8 even, pre-filtering. Has it been at least 10 minutes below 73 decibels? Nope. Okay, then we already drop it. And now there's the third one, transmission risk level 8 again. It has been a little bit uh, away, but there's also been some close contacts, so we do the pre-filtering. Has it been at least 10 minutes below 73? Now we already have to look closely, so yes, it is below 73, this one as well. Okay, so we've got four dots below 73 decibels, gives us 12 minutes, yes. Transmission risk level three, okay, that's easy, yes. And now we can do the calculation. It has been six minutes at the low attenuation, those two dots here, okay, they count full. And zero minutes at the medium attenuation, you see, this part here is empty, and the transmission risk level 8 gives us a factor of 1.6. If we now multiply those 6 minutes by 1.6, we get 9.6 minutes. So if this has been the only encounter for that day, it's still green. But if, for example, you had two encounters of this kind, so with the same person or with different people, then it would already turn into red, because then it's close to 20 minutes, which is above the 15 minute threshold. Now, I would like to thank you for listening to my session and I'm available for Q&A shortly. Okay, so thank you, Thomas. This was a pre-recorded talk and uh, the discussion was very lively in the IRC during the talk. And I'm glad that uh, Thomas will be here for the Q&A. Um, maybe to start... Maybe to start with the first question by MHAR in IRC on security and replay attacks. No. Italy and Netherlands published the TAK SDK so early that they are still valid. We learned that yesterday in the time machine presentation. How is this handled in the European cooperation and can you make them adhere to the security requirements? This is uh, the first question for you, Thomas. Okay, so uh, thank you for this question. Um, the way we handle keys coming in from other European countries, that's through the European Federation Gateway Service, is that they are handled as if they were national keys, which means they are put in some kind of embargo um, for two hours until, so two hours after the end of their validity to make sure that such replay attacks are not possible. All right. I hope that answers That's this question. Actually, it's so. Yeah. Okay. And then there was another one on international interoperability. Um, is it EU, EU only, or is there also cooperation between EU and, for example, Switzerland? So, uh, so far, we've got the cooperation with uh, other EU countries. There's 
from the European Union, uh, which App interoperates already. And um, regarding the integration of non-EU countries, that's basically a political decision uh, which has to be made from uh, this place as well then. So that's nothing I, as an architect, can uh, drive or control. Um, so, so far, it's only EU countries. All right. And then they have some uh, uh, comments and also questions on community interaction and implementation of new features, um, which seems a little slow for some. Um, there was, for example, a proposal for a functionality called Crowd Notifier for events and restaurants to check in by scanning a QR code. Um, can you tell us a bit more about this or was there? are you aware of this? So um, I... I personally have seen that there are proposals online and that there's also a lively discussion on those issues. But what you need to keep in mind is that we are also, um, we have the task of developing this app for the uh, Federal Ministry of Health. And they are basically the ones requesting features. And then there's some uh, scoping going on. So um, I'm personally, I'm the so to say that again, I'm the architect, so I can't decide which feature is going to be implemented. It's just that as soon as the decision has been made that we need a new feature. So we've been, uh, after we've been given the task, then I come in and uh, prepare the architecture for that. So um, I'm not aware of the current state of those developments, to be honest, because that's out of my personal scope. All right. I mean, it's often the case, I suppose, with great projects to do the projects. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah. overall, people seem to be uh, liking the fact that everything is uh, available on uh, GitHub. Um, but some people are, are really dedicated and seem to be a bit disappointed that uh, yeah, interaction with the community on GitHub seems a bit slow um, because some issues are not answered as people would hope it would be. Um, do you know that uh, about some ideas on uh, adding dedicated community managers uh, to the GitHub community around the app? So the people uh, we speak with, that was one note in the ISC, seem to be changing every month. So are you aware of this kind of position of community management? So there's people definitely working on the community management. Uh, there's also a lot of feedback and comments coming in from the community. And I'm definitely aware that um, that there are people working on that. And for example, uh, I get asked to them uh, by them to jump in on certain questions where clarification is needed from an architecture point of view. And that's um, if you look at GitHub, there's also some issues I've been answering. And that's because our community team has asked me to jump in there. So, um, but the feedback that people are not fully satisfied with the way how the community is handled is something I will definitely take back to our team internally and let them know about it. Yeah, that's great to know, actually. <laughs> um, so people have some answers on that. Maybe one last very concrete question by Duffman in the ISC. Um, is he an inability of the app to show the time day of exposure is a limitation of the framework or is it an implementation choice and what would be the privacy implications of introducing such a feature? Actually a big question, but maybe you can cut it short. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the only information the exposure notification framework by Google Apple can give us is the uh, date of the exposure and date always relates to UTC there. And so we never get the time of the actual exposure back. And when moving to the exposure windows, we also do not get the time back of the exposure window. And the implications, if you were able to tell the exact time of the encounter, would be that people are often aware where they've been at a certain time. And let's say uh, at 11.15, you were meeting with a friend and you get the notification that at 11.15, you had that exact encounter um, it would be easy to tell whom you've met who's been infected and uh, that's something um, not not desired, that you can trace it back to a certain person. So we personification would basically then be the thing. 
All right, and I hope we have time for this last question. Tish asks in IRC, have you considered training a machine learning method to classify the risk levels instead of the used rule-based method? So, um, I mean, class classifying the risk levels through machine learning um, is uh, something I'm not aware of yet. Um, so the thing is, it's all based on basically a cooperation with the Fraunhofer Institute, where they have basically uh, reenacted certain situations, did some measurements, and that's what has been transferred into the risk uh, model. So all those thresholds are uh, derived from basically practical tests. So no ML at the moment. All right. So I suppose this was our last question. And um, again, um, Thomas, a warm round of virtual applause to you. And thank you again, for Tom Thomas, for giving this talk, for being part of this first remote case experience and for giving us some insight into the back end of the Corona One app. Thank you. I was happy to do so. Thank you for having me here. Thank you.